The third big topic that we're discussing here now is the question of should we use point of care ultrasound? And maybe Jean-Jacques, uh, can I have you present uh, your experience here because you've been instrumental in implementing this on intensive care units in the medical community. So you are probably one of the leading experts on this field. Can you maybe just uh, present us uh, your experience with teaching and also using uh, this in uh, patients such as COVID-19? Okay, j just to begin with, uh, uh, you know, in this patient, we need to avoid intra-hospital contamination. So the aim is to avoid to go to CT scans. Uh, maybe we should avoid uh, bedside chest radiography because each time the uh, radiologist technician is entering the ICU with the big machine, then it's difficult to decontaminate and there is a risk of contamination. So ultrasound uh, offers the possibility of giving a very good uh, view of the lung status according to time without transporting the patient or some foreigners entering the ICU to make a special examination like a chest X-ray. So I think it is the um, probably the method of choice. But most of the time we are using bilky uh, ultrasound device because we want to do transesophageal cardiac echography, we want to do transthoracic cardiac echography, abdominal echography, and lung ultrasound. So most of the time we are using bulky machines and it's very difficult to decontaminate these uh, machines. So we have taken the option uh, to use uh, the pocket size machine that very, are very easy to uh, decontaminate to avoid this risk of intra ICU contamination. This is just a small introduction to explain why we should use uh, these uh, ultra pocket size ultrasound uh, devices. Okay, so that's uh, of course a very important part. Uh, we need to take care that we do not infect or would not carry uh, you know, viruses to other places of the hospital. And the uh, point of care ultrasound is small. It's uh, relatively easy uh, to take with you and it's probably easier to disinfect as well. Um, uh, but what about uh, just in general, the role of, um, of ultrasound? Uh, I'll, I'll just maybe start your presentation and maybe you can just uh, uh, okay, comment okay. on it. I will, I, will, uh, I will drive it. From my computer. Okay. Easier. Okay. So this is uh, the Lapitia Salpetriere Hospital. It's a very large hospital, and this is one of the ICU. We have six beds on one side and six beds on the other side, isolated one-bed rooms. Okay. So you are going to take the probe of your ultrasound machine and put it in. And on an intercostal space, because the intercostal space is the acoustic window to see the line. Normally, if the aeration is normal, you do not see anything. So this is the subcutaneous tissue. Your probe is here. The bright line is the pleural line with a lung sliding, both sheets of the uh, pleural layer are moving on each other. And then you have an artifactual repetition of horizontal line called E-lines, okay? This is a normal aeration. So if somewhere on the chest wall you see that, it means that it is normal. It's a very important information. You know, it, Sometimes in dependent part of the lung, you may have one, two uh, vertical lines. This is not abnormal. So the normal aeration is defined as the presence of E lines, horizontal lines, or less than three vertical B lines. Okay, now we move to interstitial syndrome. You know, the excess of inflammation, lung water, involves exclusively the interstitial space. And this can be the case 
in uh, hemodynamic edema, fibrosis, and early stage, non-critical stage of SARS-CoV-2 viral pneumonia. It has been uh, described, you know, some very early ultrasound examination uh, demonstrate these ultrasound pattern characteristic of interstitial syndrome. So the abnormal interface between gas and tissue produce vertical artifacts called B-lines. This is uh, the characteristic of the vertical lines. You know, they are arising from the plural line, well-defined, reaching the edge of the screen, moving with plural line, and you do not see any more horizontal E-lines. This is an example of what you can see. This is an hemodynamic pulmonary edema, okay? You know, the interlobular septa are thickened, and the interface between this excess in tissue in the interlobular septa and the gas create this regularly spaced vertical beeline. You cannot miss it. And this is never observed in source cov 2 pneumonia because it is not an hemodynamic syndrome. Okay, sometimes the uh, multiple B lines are irregularly spaced, and you know there is an impaired lung sliding, and this is seen in non-critical source cough to pneumonia. Uh, sometimes the B lines are issued from juxtapleural consolidation. This is characteristic of non-critical SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. Now, I take an example. If you have an ultrasound machine and a patient comes with clinical signs uh, corresponding to non-critical SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia, if you perform lung ultrasound, you will detect this small juxtapleural consolidation with b lines issued from this consolidation. This is typical. You will see that in emergency wards, in uh, infectious uh, uh, department. You know, the uh, next step is to have, you know, very much larger subpleural consolidation. And they are also seen in non-critical SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. They are uh, the reflect of confluent bronchopneumonia. It's a, 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 a more severe stage than the previous one. But you know, the aeration is still relatively preserved in the line. You know, sometimes you have localized areas of ground glass areas, and they give this is a rib, rib, and then you can see coalescent B lines issued from the plural line. But if you move your probe along the intercostal space, then they will disappear. They are localized. And this is also typical of non-critical SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. Now, if the patient has acute respiratory failure, and if he has an hemodynamic pulmonary edema, as you can see, the ground glass areas on the CT scan are widespread. And then you will get everywhere on each intercostal space, coalescent B line issued from the plural line. This is a typical of hemodynamic pulmonary edema. You do not see that, see that in COVID patients. What you are seeing is something like in RDS. This is an RDS, it is not. Uh, COVID uh, pneumonia. Then you have uh, ground glass areas and the coalition B line are issued from subpleural consolidation. In other words, you have a foci of bronchopneumonia and you have pulmonary edema, hyperme 
possibility type of pulmonary edema. What is typical, absolutely typical, of uh, SARS CoV 2 is this CT aspect. It's a ground glass area, it's not consolidations, that is widespread through the lung parenchyma. And then when you put the probe on the chest wall, you have this diffuse B2 line, coalescent B line, all over the chest wall. All the patients we had, uh, more than 30, correspond to this pattern. In ARDS, you have a predominance of consolidation. In a critical SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia, you have a predominance of B lines. It means that there is some gas persisting in the lung, but coexisting with pulmonary edema, which is protein rich. It's a high permeable type pulmonary edema. In fact, lung consolidations, like you can see here, are not very frequent in SARS CoV 2 patients. When they are admitted to the ICU, we don't see consolidation contrasting with the other cause of RDS. In the other cause of RDS, you have massive consolidations of lower lobes, like you can see on this uh, ultrasound video with a pleural effusion. But in SARS, COVID, the uh, pleural effusion is rare and the consolidation occurs uh, or delayed. They occurs three, four, five days after the admission, because most of the time there is a bacterial through infection. Then you can see the consolidations. And the consolidations are with a hyper echoic punctiform image, reinforcing at inspiration. It's attesting the static air bronchogram. The uh, bronchial tree is still filled with air and the lung parenchyma is consolidated. Sometimes you see the uh, secretion moving inside the consolidation in the bronchial tree. This is typical of pneumonia, not typical of SARS pneumonia. It is uh, typical of super infection of COVID patients with uh, common gram negative bacteria. What is interesting is. Uh, that in the consolidation, you have a persisting blood flow. If you put the Doppler here, your probe is here, you put the Doppler, you see that the uh, uh, pulmonary blood flow is persisting, ex explaining that the patient is deeply hypoxemic. In fact, you uh, evidence the pulmonary shunt. Okay, so pleural effusion, as I told you, is relatively rare in non-critical and critically ill patients with SARS-CoV-2. We do not see pleural effusion a lot of time. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, for the first 30 patients, no one had to be uh, uh, drained. Uh, there, there was no, virtually no pleural effusion. Pneumothorax, we don't know exactly because we didn't see yet any uh, pneumothorax. You see that lung ultrasound is uh, very uh, accurate to detect lung ultrasound. In fact, there is a abolition of lung sliding. And if you use a monodimensional echo, then you will have these linear lines. You know, partial pneumothorax can be easily detected by lung ultrasound. Look, if you have an anterior pneumothorax, then the uh, junction between the lung parenchyma and the gas is moving. And you can see the lung point here moving. So you can very easily detect uh, anterior pneumothorax using lung ultrasound. So I just want to show you. Uh, the difference between a pocket-sized uh, ultrasound device and a bulky ultrasound device. 
this uh, video were taken in uh, six years ago in our ICU uh, because uh, we used the um, B scan. It was the first version. There was a single probe. There was no Doppler. To see how it is easy to 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 handle, and and, and then to clean, of course. This is uh, the, the you can see the B line in this patient. It was not now, and uh, six years ago, this patient had a, a hemodynamic pulmonary edema. So we discovered uh, at that time the advantages of uh, pocket size ultrasound machine. So what we have decided in our uh, two ICUs is to uh, separate. Uh, the beds. Beds one to six will be handled exclusively with the pocket size uh, ultrasound machine. No chest x ray, no transportation to the CT scan. And we will perform lung ultrasound score each day to monitor the lung status. And if we see that the lung is re aerating, then we'll perform immediately a spontaneous breathing uh, trial to try to extubate as early as possible the patient and have some more room for the patient waiting for admission in the ICU. On the other beds, seven to 12, we'll use a very bulky ultrasound machine. And of course, we cannot use as often this ultrasound device to monitor the lung status. So in this part of the ICU, we have permitted the uh, practice of bedside chest radiography. And then we'll compare uh, the duration of mechanical ventilation. In this part of the ICU, we'll monitor each day the lung ultrasound score. Here, we'll monitor using bedside chest radiography according to the uh, physician decision, ultrasound according to the difficulty to uh, transport and decontaminate this machine. Here, all the catheter insertion and control of the adequate position will be done uh, with this uh, pocket size ultrasound device. In other words, there will be no transportation, virtually no transportation outside the ICU or no bedside chest radiography. And then we'll compare this, um, the time of mechanical ventilation uh, the number of contamination, the time required to decontaminate this machine and this machine. And uh, this study is going on. It is embedded into the clinical care here, facilitating the care for the physicians, uh, avoiding probably uh, contamination in the ICU. And it is supported by the uh, clinical research of uh, assistance public Hôpital de Paris, which is the big organism uh, running all the uh, university hospital in Paris. Thank you. Jean-Jacques, it's really, really amazing what uh, you're doing in this very, very critical phase to provide more information on how we can manage these patients. And I can only reiterate, lung ultrasound is a very, very important modality. And if we can maybe tell what the prognosis of the patients is and how we should manage them based on the lung uh, picture that we saw just previously, I think that would be a tremendous advantage. Obviously, CT is something we cannot implement on a large scale in these patients. Um, for all of you who are interested to learn ultrasound, it's something that is not so difficult to learn. Yes, you'll need some experience, but uh, it's something that you can learn. And what we from Wanted Sonography did, we filmed a complete lecture, a course, um, on, um, of course, point of care ultrasound. And there will also include the topic of lung ultrasound. So if you are after the lecture, you can go to the web page that I will present to you at the end of the presentation and you will be able to download or to look at your lecture. It's yours. You can uh, view it as often as you want to and maybe kickstart your career in ultrasound, lung ultrasound, if you haven't done it so far. So I think it's a very important initiative that is supported also 
by General Electric, I must honestly say they've been helping us tremendously in, of course, uh, moving uh, education forward to you. I guess uh, they uh, understand that it's very important that at this stage we need to provide information, especially since many other channels are not possible at the moment based on the fact that all conferences and, and meetings are now uh, banned. So this is a very important factor that I just want to mention again. Uh, but now let me just uh, move on and I, I do want to have uh, maybe also Martin's presentations on um, ultrasound because this is also something that is uh, very important because uh, as I mentioned previously, not all patients have COVID, uh, but patients with COVID can also have other problems. So here are some case examples to demonstrate the role of point of care ultrasound. This is a case example um, where we have to look really closely what the problem is. We are now seeing Reinhard. Reinhard presents with dyspnea and he had a myocardial infarction two months ago. And he tells me, I think there is water inside of me. And here you see two loops. On the left hand side, you see the IVC, that's the echo loose structure in the center of the image. It seems dilated and with respiration, it's not collapsing entirely. Above the IVC, you see the liver. And on the right hand side, you see the liver again and the liver veins. They also seem to be a bit dilated. And if you move to the next slide, we see a left hand side, the liver again, and we see another echolucent structure, two echolucent areas. One is pleural effusion that's on the left side. And on the right side, if you do look really closely, we also see ascites. And in the loop on the right side, we see the liver and the kidney again. And in this area where the arrow pointed now, um, we see again an echolucent area which, which also points towards societies. And if we look around a little bit more and tilt and turn the transducer, we see more areas in the abdomen and in the lungs where there is free fluid present. And now the question is, what is the problem of the patient? And with point of care ultrasound, we of course also can scan the heart. And if we look at the next two loops, we see on the left hand side a short axis view of the heart and see in the center of the image the left heart. It's shaped like a D, so a D-shaped left ventricle. And the right ventricle seems rather big. So that's a sign for elevated right heart pressure. And if we look at the right side in the image, it's pointing already towards the right ventricle and the right atrium. And the right ventricle and the right atrium, they're severely dilated. And what you also can see in the center here is an ICD. So this echo dense structure, exactly. So that's the ICD. And if we go to the next loop and we implement color Doppler. So this was, those are all images from also a handheld device. The V-Scan extent, what we have seen in the previous presentation, it was the V-Scan without color Doppler imaging. Here we can add color Doppler and we see a massive TR. So what is the problem of this patient overall? This patient had a myocardial infarction and he had an LED and a right coronary artery problem. Uh, go to the next slide, thank you. And he has a pleural effusion and a severe TR, probably ICD related, and he has a situs and a reduced right ventricular function. So this patient had dyspnea, but of course this was not a COVID patient, at least not at this time. Let's have a look at uh, another patient. Her name is Greta and Greta presents 9 a.m. on Sunday and she's 85 years old and she complains of dyspnea and therefore quite some time she doesn't remember when this the dyspnea actually started and for now she has never seen a doctor in her entire life and she doesn't take any kind of medication but if we perform point of care ultrasound we can see some interesting findings on the left hand side we see the liver and we see somewhat dilated liver veins and also we see a perfusion. It's not too big, but it's definitely present. And if you look at the right side, that's an image, uh, a subcoastal image of the heart. And we see here where the marker is pointing now, a pleurifusion again. And we see uh, also a little bit dilated IVC and we get a glimpse of the heart.
it is a more clear presentation of the purely fusion. Again, all these echo free areas, exactly here, this is purely fusion. And now we have to go and see why this patient has a purely fusion and dilated liver veins. And if we see the next slide, we see a peristernal long axis of the heart. So a peristernal image on the left side without color Doppler, on the right side with color Doppler. And in the center of the image, we see the aortic valve. And it's quite bright and quite white. So this is massively calcified. And if we do look at left ventricular function, it seems pretty poor. Also look at the mitral valve, how it is opening, just a little bit of opening of the mitral valve. So left, the left ventricle exactly here pointed out with the marker and here the mitral valve. And if we go to the next image, we see an apical four and five chamber view. And what we can appreciate here is a little bit of pericardial effusion, even around the left ventricle on the left side of the image, exactly here. And we see a severely reduced left ventricular function. And on the right side of the image, again, we see the reason for all of this. It's um, this massively calcified aortic valve. And so what is the, what is the diagnosis? What did we see overall? In this patient, we saw an aortic valve, and this aortic valve was severely calcified. So we have, we do have the suspicion of aortic stenosis, of course. And left ventricular function is severely reduced. Exactly. Also, right ventricular function we did take a, a brief look at it, and it seems to be still rather normal. So, again, another patient with presenting with dyspnea, um, having a different disease, not COVID-19, but severe aortic stenosis. And the last patient I want to present to you is a patient, an immunosuppressed patient, a patient who received the new lung just two months ago. And because this patient was in contact with staff members who were tested eventually positive um, after having COVID-19 uh, symptoms, they had, they, they were coughing, they had dyspnea, and this PCR was performed two days after he had contact with the staff and it was negative. Uh, we received the patient at the rehabilitation center and of course we were concerned and questioning ourselves what can we do and how to deal with this patient. This was a patient with lung transplant or receiving a lung transplant and we are having some patients who are immunosuppressed because they received a lung transplant. So of course we isolated the patient and we made sure that the patient um, is not exposed to us as well. So we always try to keep as much distance as possible. And we were wearing, of course, masks. And then a few days later, the patient started coughing. So again, what did we do? We decided because of the high risk of the patient to test the patient again. And, but that was not all what the patient was experiencing. Also before the patient came to us, the patient had a perforation of the small intestines. And now, when we took the test, he was mentioning that he feels abdominal pain. And when you touch the abdomen, the abdomen was actually hard. So we perform point of care ultrasound. And in the next image, we see uh, right upper quadrant view, we see the kidney, the right kidney in the center of the image. We see a bit of the liver. And in the Morris's pouch, so in between the right kidney and the liver, we do not see free fluid at first glance. And when we move the probe to the point of pain of the patient where the patient felt that it really hurts, we see in the center of the image, this is a, a dilated intestines and we see this pendulum peristalsis. And because of the history of the patient, and because we did see this on the point of care scan, uh, we sent him back to the, to the hospital he got the lung from. And of course there was performed the CT scan and how does, did this patient or did this story continue? Um, the CT scan was positive for a perforation of small intestines and he was operated immediately. Um, well knowing that this patient had contact with COVID-19. So of course the hospital where he was operated, they took measures that they also treated him like a COVID positive patient. After all, he was COVID-19 negative at the second test as well. Uh, a wonderful example, again, how we can use ultrasound 
uh, it's so, so ubiquitously in different settings and it makes so many important diagnoses. So thanks a lot, Martin. Um, again, uh, for all of you who are interested to learn point of care ultrasound, we have free lectures for you, a course, a mini course, which uh, are going to be 25 minutes each. Um, after the presentation, all you need to do is go to the web page that I will display at the end, and then you can actually download uh, or actually look at the presentation. Good. Um, so yes, point of care ultrasound is very important, but I don't want to move back again to long ultrasound and maybe uh, let's go back to Texas. Let's see how it is done there. So um, the reason I had this slide up was um, there are some very good studies done, uh, some out of Italy, some out of China, uh, demonstrating um, a CT scan and chest x-ray findings uh, on patients. And uh, I think Dr. Ruby and Martin both, uh, both mentioned that ground glass opacities uh, with or without consolidation is your alert sign where you get concerned uh, about uh, COVID-19. Um, some of these CTs have bilateral. There's some that they've seen unilateral ground glass opacities with. Uh, and then the x-ray findings are very subtle areas of opacities uh, that you can see on their chest x-rays. Uh, there are other uh, findings that we can uh, use as well, including lab um, findings. So leukopenia and lymphopenia are hot ones. Um, other than that, uh, elevation of liver enzymes and the D-dimer, uh, those are things that kind of help you uh, make a presumptive diagnosis and then confirm it with uh, testing. Uh, but lung ultrasound, we've been talking about it for quite a while now. Um, there's some specific findings that are related to COVID-19. Some of them Dr. Uh, Ruby has shared already, and I'll continue on that. So in the ICU, uh, you will have patients that are mostly supine, um, and uh, uh, you know the you have to define out lung zones. Uh, so this is from uh, Dr. Uh, Lichtenstein, uh, where um, he's defi defined out three zones, um, and then an upper and a lower. So kind of six zones on one side, so 12 zones in total to the lung, uh, where you would ultrasound a patient. Uh, one important zone to remember is the PLAP, the posterior lateral alveolar uh, space um, or plural space uh, that's uh, at, at zone three in the lower. Uh, so that's one, one of the spaces that we absolutely have to uh, ultrasound in addition to everything else. So there's some artifacts on uh, lung ultrasound uh, that we use, and these were mentioned before. So uh, the image on the left is showing us A lines. Those are repetitive lines uh, that you can see, and those are basically re reflections of the plural space. And it's a uh, artifact that we see on uh, the ultrasound image. Uh, and on uh, the second, uh, uh, on the right side, uh, you can see uh, some very thin B lines. Uh, one of the other things that we're also uh, paying a lot more attention to, specifically uh, related to the, the flu pandemic, uh, but also related to COVID-19, is looking at the plural line. So on the right side, you can see uh, a very irregular plural line. It's not very thickened, uh, but every time it moves, it's not one straight line. It's got some irregularities to it. And it's different from the image on the left where you've got a thin, very regular uh, plural line. Um, when you have patients that are uh, are sitting up, for example, in the emergency room or in the ward, uh, I would recommend that you perform uh, lung ultrasound in the posterior chest as well. And in kind of a lawn lawnmower fashion where you pick one rib space and then you uh, scan that entire rib space all the way laterally and then you go up or down depending on where you start. The things that we're looking for are the plural line, uh, the characteristic of the B lines, and then the quantity of the B lines we're seeing. And so on this slide, it's a good demonstration of um, plural irregularities. So the one uh, mentioned as few B lines and the one is mentioned uh, as many B lines, uh, both of those uh, have irregularities of uh, the plural line that you can see very well. Uh, the image in the middle, you can see a thickened pleura. So both of these have been reported, uh, both uh, plural irregularities and plural thickening. Uh, both have been reported uh, in COVID-19 patients on lung ultrasound. Um, uh, it, the the thing I want to mention out of this slide is when you look at the the slide that shows many B lines, you're seeing uh, confluent B lines uh, in this uh, confluent B lines. Uh, which are associated with plural thickening or plural irregularities and their distribution. That can tell you a lot about whether this patient is likely to have COVID-19 or not. So um, the clinical correlation uh, is very important uh, for figuring out um, what we're seeing on lung ultrasound. And uh, its distribution um, uh, is also 
carries a lot of uh, information for us. So first of all, obviously, when we clinically correlate, it'll start off with symptoms, the right patient, someone who's having fever, someone with shortness of breath or a cough, uh, who's may or may not have had uh, contact with a patient with COVID-19. And uh, I, I kind of came up with this, uh, with this chart when I teach ultrasound to my residents or my fellows, I use this chart as well that you've got to focus on the distribution of lung ultrasound uh, B line findings. So if you have bilateral uh, B lines and if they're diffuse, you start thinking about processes like pulmonary edema and ARDS. If you have bilateral um, B lines, but they're only in certain spots uh, on the lungs, not throughout the lung, uh, you would start thinking about multifocal infections. Um, interstitial lung disease can also give you B lines and Apache distribution that's bilateral. So that's something else to think about. And on the rare occasion, a viral infection such as um, COVID-19 or the flu can also give you those findings. In the unilateral findings, when they're diffuse, uh, you either start thinking about asymmetric pulmonary edema that's usually non-cardiogenic um, or a large uh, lobar infection or a large infection on one side of the lung. Um, patchy infiltrates that are, or patchy B lines uh, that are unilateral uh, would mostly point you towards focal infection. And Dr. Ruby uh, shared some of those uh, slides earlier. So a uh, viral pneumonia. Viral pneumonia is, um, is, is a hot topic in, in lung ultrasound right now. And the three things that I have learned um, to look for uh, in these patients, um, obviously looking for confluent B lines, looking for a patchy distribution, whether that's unilateral or bilateral, and also looking for plural irregularities. Um, I also combine lung ultrasound with cardiac ultrasound because the lung and the heart kind of work together. And if you can uh, correlate what you find on the lungs with the heart, so if you have a low EF and you have bilateral B lines uh, that are diffuse, it kind of gives you a diagnosis there already. Uh, could this patient also have COVID-19? Absolutely could. But is it the primary thing that I'm going to be treating right now? Probably not. So um, this is something that I've put in there um, as a... Um, uh, a finding that would deter you from saying this is absolutely SARS-CoV. So air bronchograms are mostly uh, uh, classified as either static or dynamic, and they're seen uh, in a, a consolidative process. If you have lung consolidation, uh, your lung will become uh, hepatized uh, and very well seen on the image uh, on the right, um, that hepatization of the lung, uh, it almost looks like the echo texture of a liver. Um, within that, if you have trapped air, um, that would show you static air bronchograms, and static air bronchograms are actually shown better on the on the uh, image on the left. Uh, the C is marking the consolidations, and the D is marking the diaphragm that you can see coming in and out. Um, the characteristic of dynamic air bronchograms is being able to see um, air move in and out of uh, the lung, and on that image on the right, you can very well see um, the air moving in and out with respirations. Uh, it argues this being atelectasis because atelectasis technically should not have uh, any air movement. Uh, there are other studies that have been performed using M mode on uh, a consolidated lung or using Doppler to see the movement of air uh, if it's not well, well visualized um, on the ultrasound. So those are two additional things that we can uh, sort of incorporate um, to um, strengthen our suspicion of this being a low bar pneumonia uh, or not pneumonia. This is not something you should see with uh, SARS-CoV. This is something that is low bar pneumonia or atelectasis. Um, effusions also, uh, there's a small effusion that you can see uh, on the image on the right, which is labeled as an E in white. Um, effusions are also uncommon, uh, almost very, very rare in viral infections. Uh, there are uh, two case reports that I've read with very small effusions in patients who were uh, COVID positive, and I'm suspecting those are par probably paranomonic and, uh, effusions from a super infection uh, with uh, bacterial pneumonia. Uh, the other finding uh, that you will see with pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia uh, on ultrasound is a shred or a fractal sign. And this is where um, a consolidated lung is having an interface with a normal lung. And so that same interface of, air, um, of fluid and air, you're seeing deeper down in the lung. Um, so both of these are, are actually obtained by a uh, portable um, device, a, a V-scan extend. Uh, and you can see those shred signs on both of those. Both have a very small pleural effusions. I think the one on the left would have a slightly larger uh, pleural effusion uh, than the right-hand side. Again, another thing that if you see uh, a large pleural effusion, so a pleural, uh, uh, a normal lung will look like the, the image 
image on the left where you can see the diaphragm and you can see the lung coming in and out um, of, of, that, uh, of the diaphragm, almost like a curtain. Uh, the O is the organ that's below the diaphragm that can either be the liver or the spleen, uh, and the D is labeled as the diaphragm. Uh, on the image on the right, you can see a large pleural effusion. You can see the tip of the lung that has resorptive atelectasis on it, and then you can see the diaphragm and the organ on the other side. If you're seeing a large pleural effusion in someone who has a fever and a cough, um, this is not primarily from COVID uh, infection. Uh, this is probably from something else. I would recommend doing a heart ultrasound uh, to make sure that they don't have congestive heart failure um, or don't have a history of malignancy that's giving them uh, a large effusion on this side. And then uh, on the next slide, you'll see um, complicated effusions. So effusions that have uh, septations and debris within them. These are absolutely not related to uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, in fact, the image uh, on the uh, on the on the left uh, was from a patient uh, that had a empyema uh, from a bacterial process and required a tube thoracostomy with drainage. Uh, image on the right, uh, um, labeled as S, uh, you can see septations within uh, the effusion. Uh, and again, something that uh, carries you away from a primary diagnosis uh, of uh, a COVID-19 uh, infection. Um, there, uh, there are some small effusions, again, being reported with um, a COVID uh, infection, but nothing as large as these ones or as complicated uh, as these ones uh, that could be uh, there. If they're present with COVID-19, these are probably related to a super infection uh, with a bacterial pneumonia or a bacterial empyema um, that's giving you these findings on lung ultrasound. Uh, and then the last slide that I wanted to talk about was uh, a blue protocol. So Dr. Uh, Lichtenstein, a uh, big name in lung ultrasound in the U.S., uh, sort of coined this together. Uh, and kind of helped you um, differentiate what kind of profile your patient has and, and lead you to a diagnosis. Uh, the A profile is where you have normal lungs, uh, you don't have any B lines, there's no, there's no interstitial filling process. And in the right patient, that could be an indication uh, for pulmonary embolism. Um, they, they recommend doing uh, DVT scans uh, using ultrasound uh, to get more additional information uh, that would help you make that diagnosis. A B profile is mostly B lines uh, when they're bilateral, as we talked about early, that could be a sign of pulmonary edema, uh, unilateral, uh, and uh, you could think of a pneumonia. Uh, and then the C profile is a consolidation uh, profile where you're seeing uh, those findings in uh, the uh, PLAP or the posterior lateral alveolar and pleural space. Um, where you're seeing consolidations and that would give you uh, a, a reason to believe that this is uh, pneumonia. So this is something that I, um, I've, I've kind of automated in my mind. Uh, and I think uh, the ultrasound device that I use actually uh, helps you make a lung protocol out of it. Um, it's a software that they've installed onto the device. And it kind of, kind of walks you through this entire protocol as well, which would be helpful to use for uh, novice ultrasonographers or people who are just getting started on lung ultrasound.